I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over, and Gabrielle Zevin's 10th book is out now. It's our July BNN Book Club pick. And you guys, this book is amazing. And honestly, even if you're not a gamer, I do not want you to fear this book. This is a great story. It's a love story. It's a love triangle. It's all sorts of good stuff. It's a coming of age for multiple characters. It's very cool. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Gabrielle, thank you so much for joining us on this show. How did this book start for you? You know, it's funny. I feel like almost jealous of authors who have really simple answers to that question. Mm -hmm. You know, I always want to be JK Rowling and just say, I came up with all of Hogwarts on the train ride, you know, Mm -hmm. but for me, I never really have one idea that is like the thing that's the whole thing. I feel like my novels are more a reflection of sort of where I am in my life and um, the existential dilemmas and questions I'm facing at that time. And then there is a novel. But for me, a thing that they don't really tell you when you become a novelist is that it's going to forever change your relationship to books. You know, so I think that I started this novel about five years ago. I guess I'll set the scene. My Mm -hmm. ninth novel had just come out and it did less well than the eighth novel, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a part in the book where Sadie describes the fact that once she had made Ichigo, she thought she would never fail, you know, ever again. And I've had that experience multiple times where (laughs) I'm like, I have arrived, you know, and I I think we're kind of taught to believe that careers are going to be like up and up and up, you know, both business-wise and creatively, but in fact, they're not, you know? Um, And so my ninth novel did less well than my eighth novel. And there's an extent to which I felt uh, bad about that. And all I wanted to do was retreat into reading like Elena Ferrante forever and playing the games of my youth. So I found myself tracking down this old game I had played probably as a, you know, 12 year old. It's called Gold Rush. And it's about uh, these two people that are trying to get to the West Coast to exploit you know, the land to get gold, basically. And so I try, you know, it's basically about a gold rush. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you could have probably extracted it from the title. And I tried to track down this game, but, you know, really it was nowhere. And, you know, there were some, like, versions of it that I couldn't play on my computer. And then it got me, you know, researching down the line of the history of Sierra Games, which was the company that made this game. And it turned out that was a husband and a wife. And then I just started thinking about... uh, the first generation of people who had experienced uh, games and had played games their entire lives. You know, so we kind of call that the uh, exennial generation or the Oregon Trail generation. So it's this like micro generation that's in between Gen X and millennial, which I fall into. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting just to think about like what it was to have games as a formative storytelling experience. And that kind of like led me down the path of thinking, you know, I think I would love to write the story of these two artists, a Kunstler Roman. The, those have always been kind of my favorite sorts of novels, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, that was about these two artists and uh, their coming of age that mirrored the coming of age of an industry as well. So that's kind of where the idea came from. Okay, so we have three main characters. We have Sadie Green and we have Sam Mazur and then we have Marx Watanabe. And they become unfair games. But you have Sadie and Sam meet in possibly the ultimate meet cute moment. And I say that as someone who's seen a lot of movies where people meet (laughs) cute. So let's talk about how Sadie and Sam meet. And then we'll bring Marks into the picture. But these three are, they are everything to tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. You know, it's funny. I wanted to come up with a place for two characters to meet that didn't necessarily share class or background, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think a great equalizer is a hospital, you know? And so these two characters, Sam is there because he has a devastating injury, which I won't really describe how he got. And Sadie is there because her sister has cancer. And so the strange, like, just great unifying place of the hospital for all of us, you know, it's an equalizer across Mm -hmm. money, you know, people will get sick, bodies will fail. You know, so the first place they meet is a place where around them, everyone is sick and everyone is dying. So perhaps it makes sense that both of them are so drawn to making video games, you know, mm-hmm. and I and, and I think I think it's it's destiny in a sense, you know, mm-hmm. that but the thing they go into is, again, this sort of like fighting against mortality while grappling in a very real way with mortality, even at age 12. It's sweet, too, because Sadie is really the only person that Sam can open up to. and. 
If it sounds like we're dancing a lot of, around a lot of stuff in this conversation, we are. If you want the spoilers of this conversation, <laughs> you're going to have to join us for the BNN Book Club event. And the details for that are on BN.com. But in this conversation, we are staying spoiler free. So Sam's ailment is going to stay a little mysterious, at least in this conversation. But you do have a moment, and, and this sort of really establishes who these kids are. Sam is very withdrawn. He's not particularly trusting, except of Sadie. And Sadie, she's made a decision that's walking the line between friendship and charity with mm -hmm. Sam. They have this sort of very complicated relationship from start, but they clearly really do adore each other. They do. And I think, you know, if Sadie has a flaw, and I don't think this is completely a flaw, I think it's that she really craves um, approval and she mm -hmm. really craves like uh, achievement. And if, if anything, you know, this is perhaps her dominant character trait. And it's, I think, reflected in, you know, her betrayal of Sam early in the story. And, and I think um, she never really loses that. And, and I'm not angry at her for having it in a way because, you know, she is a person who, like myself, is really driven and doesn't want things that are easy. Sometimes that means sacrificing a friendship or relationship. And I don't think that makes her a terrible person. It just means there are some things she wants more. And maybe that kind of gets into where you know, the idea of women and, you know, this cliched idea that women can have it all. I get the sentiment of it. However, I think life is basically choices. And sometimes you choose certain things, which means you don't have other things. But also if Sadie were a guy, we would be having a very different conversation, wouldn't we? Yes, we would completely be having a different conversation. And it's funny, I think anyone that struggles to understand Sadie's motivations possibly doesn't know what it is to be an incredibly ambitious woman. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I, I think from my point of view, uh, when I think about her, you know, there are things that she craves that, you know, Sam and Marx even do not crave, you know, this kind of like outward approval that are also things that I myself crave that, and she needs them more. And, and the word I guess I'm looking for is validate. You know, she mm -hmm. needs to be validated creatively as an individual and as a person. And so, again, even that kind of like first error she makes with Sam you know, mm -hmm. goes back to this need for validation, you know, to be better than the sister, you know, to mm -hmm. be, uh, you know, pay attention to me <laughs> a little bit. But Sadie's also a woman in an industry that's dominated by men and always has been. I mean, it's starting to change now, it feels like, but for a long time, she was kind of the first and only in the room. And there's a moment too, where she's at MIT in college and another woman in her class was just like, yeah, we're not friends. We're right. competitors. We are not going to be a unified front in any way. And in fact, she complains <laughs> about a game that Sadie creates that's actually really kind of interesting. So can you talk about Solution and, and how you knew that was the game that Sadie was going to have to create? Well, it's interesting you mentioned the other woman in her class because mm -hmm. I do remember, um, and I was born in 1977, Mm -hmm. So I do remember a time where it didn't feel like women could really be allies of each other, like that you were kind of just fighting so hard for this one place and that you were going to be the only, you know, woman that succeeded at the expense of all other women, you know, and, and, I'm, and I think the world is much less like that today. But I kind of wanted to write a scene that depicted that, you know, when mm -hmm. you think, hey, these two women are going to become um, collaborators, you know, they're going to become partners in some way they're going to help each other and that just doesn't happen she's very threatened by her and her relationship with with dove and you know this kind of thing and you know so but with regard to solution um i, I just liked thinking like what would be a really clever game that a student could come up with you mm -hmm. know and so it got me thinking about you know at that age the kind of things i was really interested in you know in a sense it's uh to me it's a it's a great use of games because you know in solution is this a spoiler? <laughs> I don't think this particular, there's some this other games, there's some <laughs> other games that you and I are going to stay away from. I mean, certainly we're going to get to, uh, right. this is fairly early in the book. Yeah. So, but yes, in solution, you know, Sadie has a grandmother who is a Holocaust survivor. And so this is kind of her inspiration for the game culturally. Um, and she again, writes this thing. It looks kind of like Tetris. And you're like, if you're mindlessly building the widgets and you don't actually read the information that's coming up on the screen, you don't realize that you're doing, uh, that you're working for the Third Reich is kind of the idea of the game. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the person who gets the highest score in solution actually loses the game morally. 
know? And so I thought this would be the kind of thing that somebody in college would come up with and think was very, very, you know, very clever. And I like these kind of games myself, the idea that, you know, that you can use a game and the kind of like mechanics of a game to teach someone something that they might not understand otherwise. Because by the way, I am guilty of this. When I play a game, I do not, I get bored. I don't always want to read all the text that's coming mm-hmm, up, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'm very much somebody who would probably lose a game morally and be like, oh, I would laugh at it a little bit. But Sadie's classmate does not laugh at it, does not find it funny, finds it offensive. She's also Jewish and finds the thing very, very offensive, you know? I think it's interesting though, because part of what it sets up too is the idea that Sadie doesn't really want to create games just as everyone else knows them. She's not actually yeah. interested in creating the ne- next Big thing, Miss Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, whatever. I'm just using her points of reference here. Um, But she really wants to be able to tell a story. And you've written for film. You've written novels for adults and for the YA market. And then you've also here now written games because you had to create the games that are in this book. So it all comes back to story. But who showed up first? in tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow was it a character or was it an idea for one of the games that really spurred everything the first thing i had was pretty much the first scene of the novel and Mm -hmm. it was you know this guy in a train station and i could see uh and i could imagine this train station in the 90s you know (laughs) and just that he was around there just like and and disliking everyone and was so curmudgeonly And, and something about him told me he was like you know, a math major and that he was one of those guys who was like 21, but had the air of somebody who was like 45, you know, he had experienced and lived a lot. And so I just had this, I think I had that character first, but I knew that he was in a story about games. And so as people have asked me, but in any case, at that point I have a scene, but I don't have a novel, you Mm -hmm. know, I have that. And, you know, Sam, I was asked a similar question, which was who was, who came first, Sam or Sadie, you know? Mm-hmm. And the fact is, I can't imagine them existing without the other mm-hmm. one. It's all a novel of balance in a way. And so from my point of view, um, Sam had a name slightly before Sadie had a name. So he was slightly born before Sadie, mm-hmm. but there is no Sam without Sadie, you know, not at all, you know? And so I just knew that he was trying to avoid a person who ran into him in a train station, you know, that he was just somebody who didn't want to talk to whoever this person was. And then I realized he did. And so anyway, it was this whole, it was a whole process of learning to know Mm -hmm. this character better. And, and in fact, um, you know, I had been reading just before I started uh, the age of innocence and there's a part right at the beginning of the age of innocence that talks about, you know, that the whole society had been sort of like hieroglyphic, you know, and that, you know, everything symbolized something else. And I think there's a lot of Sam in that, you know, in his Mm -hmm. observation that it's lucky that the brain is programmed in such a way as to be able to like say one thing and feel and mean um, another, you know? And so I think that was essentially very Sam. And the first kind of way I even knew Sam at all was that this description of him in the oversized coat, you know, it takes a Mm -hmm. while to know a character, but you know, once I started asking myself, where did that coat come from? Why is it oversized? I'm like, oh, it comes from the, the Army Navy surplus store. And uh, Marx has bought it. That's why it's oversized. And what does that mean that this, you know, that your roommate has bought you a coat? And how and why doesn't Sam know it was bought for him? And, and then once you start, you know, so something as simple as a coat can kind of like, you know, make all of these details, I think, uh, of character and story come together. It's a great opening for the book, too. Sam and Sadie come back together. And this is where we meet Marx, who is Sam's roommate at the time. And do you think Sam and Sadie would have been able to create everything that they did without Marx? Because he really, for a young college student, he really does sort of keep them focused and sort of gets them to think in ways that artists don't always necessarily want to think about. Uh, Well, you know, the character of Marx is somebody who is incredibly intelligent and somewhat directionless you know, when we first mm-hmm. meet him, you know, mm-hmm. I think he thinks he, you know, he's a college actor and he thinks, and he knows that that's not going to be his future in a way. He's a father who is a businessman. Um, and I think he is somebody, and he talks about it himself, like, is it happenstance that I became producer of games or is mm-hmm. this something I would have chosen to do? Did I just make games because I was around some people that liked making games, you know, but no, I think Marx uh, is, I think Marx is, a person who is just in, you know, indispensable to them. You know, there has to be someone at some point who pays the bills, who waters the plants, 
who uh, figures out how you're going to sell the game um, to somebody else, no matter how great something is. And, and I know that firsthand as a novelist, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm really grateful. <laughs> you know, if you look and say the galley of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, you know, Jenny Jackson has a letter. She's my editor in the front. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, at some point you need somebody to say, this is why you should read this book. That is not me, you know? And so, and so Marx does all of those things. I am really grateful as a novelist to not be the person who has to do every single job with regard to how a novel arrives, you know, uh, you know, at a human, you know, and I think again, since I have been doing it for a while, my first novel was published 17 years ago. Mm-hmm. The only good thing that happened for that novel was that it was in Barnes and Noble discovered great new writers. That was yep. it. There was literally nothing else right that happened for that novel mm-hmm. at all. Like, <laughs> just put it out there. So, but you know, but once that happened, I became aware so much of how, uh, how many people are involved in the work of getting a novel to readers. And so mm-hmm. in a way, Marx is that person. He represents for me all the people, you know, that help me um, get my work to, to other people as well. And I'm really grateful for those people. And Marx is creative. You know, I don't want to, we'll go spoiler free, but just yep. to say that as he becomes more and more uh, formidable, to in Sadie's eyes, I think she begins to see him differently as well. As she sees him as a, as a creative person, as a contributor, Mm -hmm. you know, because at first she's very much like uh, resistant to him. She thinks Mm -hmm. he's just a shallow rich kid, you know, um, that is not going to be helpful to them. Like, just like, great, you have money. You can give us an apartment, but I just don't want you involved in this at all. And, And I think the evolution of that relationship and the evolution of like Sadie's character is really important in this story. Absolutely. And part of Marx's role in the book, too, though, is he introduces Sadie to her ultimate problem solver. She is working on the bones of the game that is really going to make their name. It's Ichigo. Mm -hmm. And she knows it has to open with a storm and she hasn't quite figured out how to make this happen. And Marx is in a play. And this is where Shakespeare meets gaming in your book. So can we talk about Marx's little assist? Well, it's funny, like, you know, Sam drags her to, well, he doesn't drag her. She's eager to meet him. But they go to see the play that he's in, which is uh, which is Twelfth Night. But the director who made it had really wanted to make The Tempest. And so she spends all her resources <laughs> making a storm, which is justifiable because there is also a shipwreck at the beginning mm-hmm. of Twelfth Night. You know, and so she's, you know, they're sitting in the audience and, they begin to, she begins to have ideas about what the beginning of a game could look like. But unfortunately, once you say storm, that means weather, that means elements, that means lighting, that means all of these things that frankly are going to be on, be beyond the ken and resources um, of the game that Sam said that they could make in a summer, right. you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, so eventually it, she comes to a place where they come up with so many great ideas for the game, but it just doesn't look like the game she knows she wants it to look like, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, at that point they realized that they're going to need to get a game engine. Now for our listeners out there that don't know what a game engine is, it's a set of tools that uh, helps you to build parts of the game. It can do with the lighting. It can do with, you know, kind of character build. It can be all different kinds of tools that are, that sort of help, you know, somebody to make a game without having to build the whole thing whole cloth. And in this case, what they need are sort of like visual tools. And so that's um, what sort of happens in the story. Unfortunately, the person who controls the game engine has all the power and the game engine that they get is from Sadie's professor, Dove, who was also her sometime boyfriend. And it really mm-hmm. just changes the power dynamic. And I liked the idea of, you know, the engine is kind of like the God machine, you know? And so you can imagine that that gives an enormous uh, power to somebody that is not uh, <laughs> the person who owns the game engine. And it sort of baked this person into Sadie and Sam and Marx's professional life forever. And I love the way you describe it in the book. You call it a physics and graph or graphics and a physics engine, which means you're rendering the story in 3D. It's all of the yeah. things that make the story come alive. And it is, you know, it's the narrative thrust of a game. Right. I never thought I would be writing something that, you know, where there would be a lot of like intricate feelings around a game engine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I didn't think like, but but then if you think about something like, say, 
like Sally Rooney's normal people, you know, like who would think that you could feel so much passion over whether like they go to that dance together, you know? Mm-hmm. And so to me, I like love the idea that you can build all of this drama around something that seems like I, I never even knew what that thing was before, you know, you have, you know, you sit down and read this book. And so I liked that. I liked the fact that in a way it was one of the things that really attracted me to writing about games in the first place, that there were like stories and scenes that I had not seen before that were driven by this kind of like technology that gave me new places I could go in my writing. You know? mm-hmm. Sam has a great line where he's talking about sort of the influences that they had. And he's like, well, it's Dickens and it's the Bible and it's Chuck Close, the artist, and it's Philip Glass, the composer. And he's like, you know, it's a lot of different things, but I can see all of it, actually, after reading your novel. It makes perfect sense that these are all of the elements that you have to pull in because you need the music, you need the movement, the actual physical movement of the characters through the game, all of these things. And, you know, you still need a story. It's no fun to play a game if there's no story and nothing happens. You can't just sit under a tree on your computer for the entire thing. That's, That's no fun. So that brings me to Ichigo, which is the game that Sam and Sadie create sort of together. I mean, he's got the conceptual art happening. She's building the actual thing. And then they have to make a decision about who to publish the game with. And this is where we start to see a little bit of a break because Sadie really wants to stick with the creative purity of it all. And Sam was like, I would like to get paid, please. I would really like to get paid. And I respect that because he doesn't come from the resources that Sadie does. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a weakness in a novel a bit when it doesn't address money. Mm -hmm. And I felt Mm -hmm. like this was so much of a thing between these two characters. You know, Sam is not poor per se, but his grandparents are really working class. Mm -hmm. They own a pizza parlor in Koreatown um, based on a real pizza parlor in Koreatown. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are working class. He's at Harvard. Everybody, uh, you know, he has a full ride to Harvard, but that doesn't like cover expenses or anything Mm -hmm. like that. He is somebody who has health problems and he needs insurance and he needs just a lot of things to live. Sadie, you know, is upper middle class or actually she's rich, you know, Sadie is rich. And so she is able to have a lot more freedom in the decisions she can make in their career. And, And it comes down to that, you know, it comes down to when, you know, one company is offering them creative freedom and, you know, maybe they'll make just as much money in the long run. And that's where Sadie wants to go. She wants creative freedom. But Mm -hmm. Sam, you know, he has health problems and money problems and doesn't come from rich people and needs to choose for money. And so she makes that decision, you know, for him. And I think in a way, uh, you know, when you have a kind of collaboration like that, there's a frustration because not all of your decisions, some of your decisions start to feel out of your control because there's Mm -hmm. no way if Sadie's alone, she's choosing that. There's no way that that's the, the path she takes, even if it's the right path. And I think, most of the people in their circle think it's the right path. But they end up building this kind of extraordinary company called Unfair Games, which is a really great name. But we watch this organization grow and change. And we watch Sadie and Sam and Marx in the context of all of this change. I mean, they all have real trajectories in this story. No one is static. In some cases, there's some do-overs. In some cases, you watch them... Uh, as some people might say, leading with their chins. (laughs) Decisions get made that don't always work. But are you sitting down and mapping this out or are you letting them sort of show you where you need to go in the story? Like, who are you as the creative driving this narrative? It's a combination of both things. Uh, I always, when I think about a book, I do think about kind of how the plot's going to move through the whole thing. And I need to come up with an ending. It is rarely this ending. I just need to know that if the, this book could end somewhere, <laughs> theoretically, but it doesn't have to be the one I've imagined. And it almost never is. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know the ending for sure until I've got there, but there's some part of my brain that needs to believe, like, if I take this plane off, it's going to land in some city. <laughs> right. I, I, and so that's kind of a thing for me whenever I'm writing. Um, and, you know, I think as I've gotten more experience as a novelist, I've just felt more willing to let the characters be unruly and out of control. You know, Mm -hmm. that once I've kind of set them going, I have an idea of things that I want to explore and do, but I like to be surprised, you know, and I feel like the the more closer they get to being people, 
you know, and I know they are constructions that I have made. The closer mm-hmm. they get to being people, the more I am surprised. I like books to have the messiness of life. And I think there was some part of me that when I started out as a novelist, you know, was felt uncomfortable with that. You know, they, you wanted them to like behave in a more like, you know, easy way for the arc. And so there are multiple times in this book where some element will happen or something will happen and it won't have been exactly uh, the thing that in my mind was going to happen. You know, even something like we spoke about earlier, Mm -hmm. like uh, the thing with the, the, uh, (laughs) I'm trying not to spoil still, but the thing with Sadie's volunteerism, let's call it, ended Mm -hmm. up being a surprise to me. You know, like I didn't know, you know, I didn't really know that that's what was happening. I knew that there was a betrayal between these two people, but I didn't know exactly what it was. You know, I thought maybe it it was just, I think in my original conception, it might've been something like, as they get older and approach high school, they grow apart for a time and they come together. I didn't Mm -hmm. realize that there was going to be an actual incident, you know, with real damages from their point of view Mm -hmm. about this, you know, and that, that, that incident would be tied to an actual object as well, you know? So I didn't know that when I started writing the book and those kinds of things actually improve a novel for me. They improve a novel when I'm reading it, they improve a novel when I'm writing, you know? Do you have a favorite moment with these guys? So the part on Matsumoto's peach farm is my favorite part of the book, probably, because, you know, it's just, it's a real place. uh, And I had a friend who went and you have to write an essay to go pick the peaches there. And they're incredible. And so anyway, they brought back peaches for me and I've always wanted to go, but I've never written the essay or had opportunity to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just like that moment because it has really nothing to do with games. It's just this purely like, you know, organic, idyllic world that we are in, you know? So, uh, you know, that was a moment that I think of in the book. And I won't really, again, it would spoil it to say where mm. it occurs, so. I want to go back to your literary influences for a second, because, I mean, obviously we've talked about sort of what the characters have alluded to, but anyone who've, who's read your earlier book, The Storied Life of A.J. Fickrey, knows that you have a love of short stories, that you are very widely read. Um, and you have a lot of opinions about books and some of them you gave to Fickery, but I think, I think some of them hit close to home, but I think it also, you've mentioned in earlier interviews that Little House in the Big Woods was the first chapter book your dad ever bought for you. And that you were also a fan of Charlotte's Web, but maybe sometimes it's your favorite book and maybe sometimes it's not. So can we talk about the stages of Gabrielle as a reader? Like who were you as a tiny person and how did we get here? <laughs> We certainly can. Uh, It's very funny because, as I mentioned, my first novel was published in 2005, so that's Mm -hmm. now 17 years ago. So you give a lot of interviews over time Mm -hmm. that, you know, they seem like they're given by a different person entirely, you know, that like, I'm like, no, yeah, that's Little House in the Big Woods. That's interesting that I said that at some point, which is actually true. I do remember my dad getting this book for me. I don't remember loving it, you know? Mm -hmm. As I think about it, I remember what I remember loving about it was the fact that my dad thought I was like mature enough to deal with like yeah. a, a real book. You know, um, there are I'm not like somebody who's in, in, insanely into like Laura Ingalls Wilder or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and, you know, when I think about, you know, this particular book, one of the things I will say is that I'm as much Daniel Parrish, who is the novelist character in the storied life of A.J. Fickery, as I am A.J. Fickery, <laughs> you know, in a lot of his opinions. You know, he talks about. And I recently had to go through the book again, so I kind of remember it. He talks mm-hmm. about how it's, you know, how it's so easy to write a bestseller when you're 25 and you know nothing, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I'm like, let's see. Uh, there's a lot of other opinions he has about about writing and just uh, the author's life in general. I've had a lot of the experience is over the years of people coming up to me and saying, you know, my this one book of yours is my favorite by far, which is something that happens to him like over and over again in, in his uh, career. And, mm-hmm. and now, by the way, I'm fine with that. It's usually a different book. It's not always the same ones. And I'm fine with that because it's a, you're just glad to have had anything resonate with anyone. You know, but for thinking about this book, uh, Tomorrow, 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 it's the book that feels closest to me of anything I have written because mm-hmm. I think, For many years, um, you know, it reflects places I've lived and places I've worked. You know, Mm -hmm. these primary settings are Los Angeles and Cambridge um, uh, and also Japan, where, you know, I have worked in Japan as well. And, you know, it it just reflects 
the fact that, you know, Sam's uh, ethnic identity is exactly mine, which I have never written before, which is I'm half Korean and half Eastern European Jewish on my dad's side. And so in a way, because this book is so close to me, um, it feels easy to to speak about in a certain way. I think for many mm-hmm. years, you know, so this will get back around. For many years, I think I think fiction was kind of a mask I wore, you know, and that for me, an interest was like burying myself in the book as opposed to exposing myself in the book, you know. Mm-hmm. And so books like Elsewhere, you know, I remember when I wrote Elsewhere, I described her as physically different from me as possible um, the main character lives mm-hmm. because I didn't want there to be any chance anyone mistook her for me, <laughs> you know, yeah. even though in fact, so much of elsewhere really to me reflects the point of view of an outsider of a biracial, you know, Asian person in America, you know, even mm-hmm. its point of view is that, but it's like optics are not that, you know? And so I think it, it's, it's maybe it's strange. It was hard for readers to find where I was in those books. And, you know, so yeah, like Anne and AJ Fickery, you know, it wasn't really something that people talked about, but to me, it is a book by a biracial author about biracial people. So when I thought about that, you know, and I think so much of my experiences as a writer and as a person have been colored by the fact that I feel like sometimes as an outsider and, and the one place I can connect with people is through through books, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I think in some ways that's where that that book came from. And so there is a through line, I think, from these books uh, to tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Sam has a great line, too, <laughs> where he says, well, you can't spoil a game, but you can spoil a book. <laughs> and right. I just I love that idea because, you know, the game's narrative is always changing. That's the whole point. Like you play it differently each time you learn things, you do things differently. Liz has a similar experience in Elsewhere. And obviously, we're going to let folks go discover that one for themselves as well. but. It's this constant learning and figuring out and going forward and having multiple lives in a way, which is what all of your characters do in the new book as well. And I think uh, that particular line is something that I read in Tom Bissell. And I can't remember if I read it before I thought it or I read Tom Bissell after. Mm -hmm. But in any case, (laughs) in one of Tom Bissell's books, he says something quite similar. And I I think that, you know, the funny thing when you get kind of like... uh, deeper into thinking about games is that they too have a story they too but in a way they give you the illusion of agency sometimes but the game Mm -hmm. itself also has a story built in you know um but there isn't maybe an obstacle in a novel and that's kind of a good thing uh (laughs) i think when you're reading a novel do you miss this world do you miss hanging out with these guys you spent five years with them i spent five years with them um sometimes like left them aside for a bit Mm-hmm. And then came back to them when I could deal with them better, you know, <laughs> I, think. I I do miss this world. I will say it's harder to imagine the thing that's next for me because I felt so uh, immersed with these people, I guess mm-hmm. is the only way to put it. You know, so I think, um, and they still, I don't know if other authors experience this, but for me, there's a time when you get kind of maybe a year past a book, you know, where it starts to feel like somebody else wrote it entirely, mm, you know, mm. like, and maybe that's me because I'm eager to cast myself away in a way. I think Sadie has this quality too, you know, and I'm not entirely Sadie, but I'm partially Sadie. Uh, I'm partially everyone, but I'm partially mm. Sadie. And, and she always kind of wants to like shed the skin of the things she's done before, you know, and I don't feel as eager to shed the skin. Like I had this feeling um, when I saw the book jacket that it was the first time I'd ever looked at a book jacket of mine. And I've liked some of my other book jackets, by the way. So I'm not saying I haven't, but where I felt like, oh, this looks like me. You know, I recognize myself in this, you know. And so there's a way in which it makes it easier to to, to speak about the book and more difficult at the same time. So. Do you think you'd ever write a sequel? to this is there more for these guys I can't, imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine I can't imagine but you know you just never know I I, I feel like I've left them where I wanted them to be I, I, and I feel like again it's interesting because even reading like you know Jonathan Franzen's book last you know last winter mm-hmm. and knowing that he is now that that we're not at the end of whatever that story is whatever right. crossroads is we're not at the end of crossroads yet mm-hmm. you know And having to kind of factor that. But I feel like when you get to the end of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, we feel like we're at the end. You know, I think the questions that you're left with are ones that actually kind of exist in your mind. You know, that if I fill them in for you, 
um, it, it sort of makes that book more less elegant or something, mm-hmm. you know, but never say, you know, never say never, you know. <laughs> well, I partially asked because you did write a trilogy for the YA <laughs> set and you I didn't did. know that was going to be a trilogy when you started, I think think right am I remembering that correctly I did think it was in fact, oh, okay sorry um so a funny story about that is that was a particular thing I had written a YA novel that I didn't I wasn't entirely sure elsewhere was a YA novel I thought maybe it was a middle grade but the way I saw it when I wrote it was that it was going to be like a little prince you know that it was kind of going to be sort of this like okay. you know fant- like small fairy tale or fantasy that adults would like as well so the problem was that the book did really well, which meant people were like, what more do you have in YA for us? So in a sense, writing that series was a solution to a problem, which was that I had not anything more really, you know, mm-hmm. about 16 year olds, you know? And so I wanted to, the reason I wanted to write a series was because I could make that person grow up, you know? So mm-hmm. she was like 16 in book one and by the end she's like 24 or something. And then I, you know, there are a lot of people that can kind of write, you know, many, many books about that particular time of life, but I am not one of them, (laughs) you know? And in the end, I think, uh, you know, the series didn't do very well. And, but I don't regret it because I learned so much about writing character from even like living with that character over time, you know? So it was a really expensive, like um, failure for my publisher, but a great learning experience for me, you know? (laughs) So are you going to keep moving back and forth between books for adults and books for YA? Well, in fact, I have not written a book for young adults for a decade. Okay. So that seems to be... So I would think, yeah, pretty much the end of that series was the end of me doing Mm -hmm. that, you know? And I think, uh, so the last and the last three novels I've published have all been for adults. So Mm -hmm. probably not, unless I had a story that said to me, oh boy, this really wants to be uh, for children, you know, Mm -hmm. something really special for children then I would maybe consider doing it. But it's not, you know, it's not a canvas I want to paint on anymore, really, you know. So we're not the only fans, obviously, of Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Tiari Jones is a huge fan. John Green is a huge fan. There's a whole list of folks who love this book the way we do. And uh, we'll put the names of the books that you mentioned as inspiration as well into the show notes, just so folks can take a look at them. Because the Knicks there's some great writing about gaming in the Knicks, but there's also a really great moment where mom is leaving her husband and son. And the way she does it <laughs> is so elegant and unexpected. And she's just sort of removing one thing at a time until they sort of notice that things are missing. Okay. And maybe mom is missing too. But it's a really terrific. And interestingly, opinion. that scene is also in um, A Widow for One Year. Yeah. She does a slow motion pack up there, yeah. which, and I know John Irving blurb uh, the Knicks as well. Yeah. And, uh, but I do feel like, again, those scenes are definitely like holding hands with each other, you know. <laughs> and tomorrow. Not and to, to take away from the Knicks. Which oh, I, no. Which I love the Knicks and A Widow for One Year. You know? Yeah, no, no, not at all. But tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow too is in development for film. So we'll see it at some point. Yes. Yes, I finished, I'm writing the screenplay, which is Mm -hmm. um, at certain points in the process, I would think to myself, why do I want to turn this rather long book into 120 pages? (laughs) Why exactly do I want to do that? But I think it's, uh, but in fact, it was an interesting process to kind of just, you know, streamline and simplify Mm -hmm. everything into a screenplay. So I've turned in a draft of that and, you know, we're negotiating, you know, how to get as much of that book in. I feel like I have producers who are really um, protective of the book and really want as much of that book in this movie as can be uh, as as is possible. And mm-hmm. so I think that when I look at movies, I don't see a lot of movies that are like tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, mm-hmm. you know, these kind of like sweeping movies that are like, you know, two and a half hours and you feel like wrung out <laughs> when it's done. You know, I feel like that's more a movie of a different era, like the 1970s or something. So I, I'm curious to see, you know, how it, it it works out. You know, I'm not just curious. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an active participant in how this works out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to see it. And I can't wait for other folks to read tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And just a reminder, the book club meetup is, uh, I think, at the end of July this time around. So just check BN.com. The details will be there and we will be fully going into the spoilers there. But this is airing right as the book is coming out. And this has been one of the best reading experiences I've had in a while. I love these characters. 
I love what you put them through. Even the one thing that we were talking about before we started taping. <laughs> right. Which we didn't talk about. <laughs> no, we'll talk about that at book club. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> we'll talk about that at book club. Gabrielle Zevin, thank you so much for joining us on Poured Over. The new book, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, is out now. Thank you so much. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. I'm Mark. I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble store in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Becky. Hello, Becky. Hello, Mark. Hi, everyone. So I am very excited for this episode. I read an advanced copy of Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow as soon as it arrived in our store. Finished it in a couple of days. It is tremendous. No big surprise. Gabrielle Zevin is incredible. Um, But we're going to talk about a couple of other books. I chose one that made me think about creating art and friendship and how those two realms don't always match up, but can really make for some beautiful stories. So I chose The Animators by Kayla Ray Whitaker. Um, This is just a fantastic story about the ebb and flow of best friendship, as well as the push and pull of a creative partnership. So Mel and Sharon are the two main characters. They are guess what, animators. And they are striving and working really hard to just create something incredible in a field that is mainly dominated by males. And guess what? They succeed. Um, Their first feature film that they create is a huge success. It's loosely based off of Mel's troubled childhood and is met with all sorts of acclaim. But with that success comes that sort of pull of doubt that really threatens to unravel their partnership and their friendship. Um, It's a fantastic story. And if you're looking for something a little different when it comes to a kind of a love story of friendship, um, look no further than The Animators. Becky, do you have one for us? I do, I do. Um, I kind of took the idea of, um, of the more of the gaming aspect of, yeah. uh, of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And um, one with something, actually, this is a book that if you're not already aware of, um, you definitely should be. It's Ready Player One by mm, Ernest Klein. Fun. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, especially if you are a fan of the 80s, um, this is just candy. It's, it really is just such a snack. Um, it's a futuristic story. It takes place in, I think, the year 2044. And basically, at that point, the world's really not a, a, an enjoyable place. So a lot of people spend most of their time in virtual reality where you can create the persona that you want um, and do whatever you want. And in that virtual, virtual reality, um, it's created by a man named um, Jack Halliday. And he has these little Easter eggs that he has hidden throughout um, this world, the worlds actually, <laughs> that you can um, explore. And it's basically a contest. It's kind of a a Willy Wonka chocolate factory idea of that if you can find this little Easter egg and then solve the puzzle, then you uh, could get the biggest prize in the world. And um, and so it really just is is a really fun um, kind of romp where they're running through all of these different worlds. You're following um, Wade, who is our hero, but then you meet some other characters along the way that are both helping and hurting. Uh, and um, and yeah, it's just kind of a fun uh, game within a game kind of idea. Um, and uh, yeah, and just very enjoyable. So uh, when you get a chance, definitely pick up uh, Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. Oh, fantastic <laughs> pick. I love that book because it feels like reading it felt like watching the Goonies for the first time. Oh yeah, it has a very Spielberg mm. flavor to it, which makes sense because he directed the film he as well. He did. He yeah. did. Although in this case, I will say, I think I like the book better oh, than the movie. I would say about 99% yeah. of the time, the okay. book is always better. Well, true. true Books story. win overall. <laughs> all things. So that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for listening to Pour It Over. Um, please support us with a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm Mark. I'm coming to you from Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm with my buddy, Becky. (laughs) Uh, You can follow our home store at BN Westchester. Thanks so much for listening, everybody, and happy reading. Bye. Bye.
Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.